Good morning. This is a wonderful opportunity that we have today to have not a good number of people in the audience, but also uh, some of the major uh, uh, U.S. scholars uh, or U.S.-based scholars uh, 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 on uh, a very important topic, international economic law. Uh, their invitation was to, to come here and speak about uh, uh, the topic of international crisis in international economic law or whether uh, uh, there is actually uh, a crisis in the way, uh, uh, whether the crisis is simply a crisis of international, economic, e international economics or whether it is uh, also a crisis on international economic law. Each of them has, have uh, proposed uh, very interesting ideas, but I'd like to start first by introducing uh, uh, their, uh, uh, by identifying them, and, uh, uh, and then saying a couple of things about uh, how uh, their uh, contributions uh, are, in a, in a way, extremely uh, 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 pertinent to the topic. Uh, my, our first speaker will be Professor Raj Bala. He is, of course, biographies. He's Associate Dean for International. He has been recently appointed Associate Dean for International and Comparative Law at Rice. I'm sure that uh, there is a new update to that. Uh, you have uh, recently nominated uh, to a new position, I, I believe. That's correct. Okay, because I thought that there was, because this is not all of this is recent. Uh, he's a distinguished professor at the University of Kansas School of Law, where he teaches courses in Islamic law, international trade law, and advanced international trade law. Uh, he holds a law degree from Harvard. Uh, he's uh, a former, um, uh, uh, he was awarded the Marx, uh, Marshall Scholarship by the British government, and he earned a master's degree in management from Oxford and a master's degree in economics from the London School of Economics. Uh, Professor Bala uh, has uh, provided, uh, is the author of a very celebrated uh, textbook, International Trade Law, and uh, he is a, uh, one of the better uh, uh, scholars on international finance and trade issues. Our next speaker will be Professor G.D. Uh, Nzlibi. Uh, he's a professor at Northwestern University School of Law. Uh, in addition to his JD from uh, Yale Law School, he holds an MPA in international relations from Princeton University, where he was uh, awarded a fellowship from the Wil Wil Woodrow Wilson uh, Foundation and a pre-doctoral fellowship from the Ford Foundation. His research and teaching interests include international trade, foreign relations law, public and private international law and contracts. Uh, <clears throat> The final speaker will be Professor Joel Trackman. He is uh, Professor of International Law at Tufts University uh, at the Fletcher uh, School of Law and Diplomacy. Uh, he's author, author of numerous books, uh, the most uh, recent of which he refers to his, in his paper, and I don't, can't bring it up to my mind, but uh, recent books include uh, The International Law of Economic Migration Toward the Fourth Freedom and uh, uh, Ruling the World, Constitu Constitutionalism, International Law, and Global Governance, Cambridge University Press. Uh, Professor uh, Trachman is also one of the leading uh, uh, scholars on international trade scholarship. He's the author of a paper that I never forgot when I read it the first time called The Domain of WTO Adjudication. Uh, uh, we are very proud to have the three guests, and uh, without further ado, I would like to uh, say just a couple of things on international, uh, uh, on the topics, on the papers. Each uh, takes a different tack on the question, but the unifying theme is the, uh, uh, to use Professor Trachman's uh, uh, term, is the decline or the growing number of anomalies in the so-called Westphalian uh, uh, paradigm, where states uh, uh, seem to be pursuing uh, out of real politic their narrow interests, the maximization of their own uh, uh, narrow interests to the detriment of major coordination problems that can be solved 
only through a, the adoption of a post-Westphalian or post-state-centered uh, 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 approach. Uh, Professor Bala's paper on uh, the, the failure of Doha Round, of the Doha Round, especially on the non-market access negotiations and the service negotiations, and he mentions a bit about the rules negotiations, uh, uh, also touches upon that effect. And he focuses uh, on China and China's pursuit of its own national, very narrow perception of its national self-interest as a very uh, a problem, a very d deep problem in the negotiations, and one of the reasons why the negotiations crumbled. But his focus is not so much on criticizing China or finger pointing in any way, but to show that uh, the problem of terrorism is one of global concern, and it seems like in the negotiations people are not really paying attention to that. Finally, Professor uh, Jidin Zlebi is actually the second speaker, uh, is going to be speaking about uh, the idea of try, uh, the contributions generally uh, from either uh, scholarship or, uh, or uh, 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 major international uh, 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 courts to try to advance the global debate on global problems and glo global policy initiatives. He believes that a firm footing on uh, uh, the understanding of the domestic component of uh, political interests, of narrow politi organized political interests, is an essential part in the thinking of how we can bring about these global uh, uh, problems or these global policy initiatives to actually produce uh, uh, measurable results. And I do believe that uh, that also calls for a thinking in the post Westphalian basis. So I guess the, the, the decline of the post-Westphalian paradigm is a common presence and perhaps one of the major reasons for the current uh, crisis or moment of uh, uh, a major moment uh, of uh, rethinking about international relations and international law at this point. Uh, I would like to pass the word to Professor Raj Baladin. Yes. Good morning, and thank you for that introduction. It's an honor to be on a panel with uh, Juscelino and Gide and Joel. And um, special thanks to um, uh, Juscelino. Uh, we runners know that you have to sometimes endure uh, pain. And uh, I know uh, he is enduring some now, uh, hopefully not because of my remarks. <laughs> the, the title of the symposium is about international on crisis. And crisis, the Oxford English Dictionary teaches us, comes from the Greek, krisis, which means decision or judgment or turning point of a disease. And in fact, the medieval Latin used it in the uh, medical sense. Um, and the OED then says the crisis is a turning point, a vitally important or decisive stage, a time of trouble danger or suspense in politics or commerce. International trade law, or more specifically the WTO as the premier multilateral forum for negotiating trade liberalizing rules, is in crisis according to this OED definition. The crisis, the sense of decision and judgment or decisive stage, is the Doha round. And the reference to the disease in the uh, ancient, uh, uh, in, the, in the medical Latin is apt. Two weeks ago in the Financial Times, a prominent European business uh, executive characterized the Doha round as a putrefying corpse. And if that's true, actually, the Doha round is beyond crisis. Um, it's dead. And uh, the WTO as a negotiating form is at least moribund, if not dead, too. Now, the paper here for this symposium is part two of a trilogy of law review articles. And the trilogy um, is being published in St. Thomas, in Case Western, and in Denver. Um, and it's entitled Poverty, Islamist extremism and the debacle of Doha Round counterterrorism. 
And each part of the trilogy goes through the different key parts of the Doha Round negotiations. Agriculture, non-agricultural market access, known in GATT, WTO speak as NAMA, services trade, trade remedies, and so on. And I'll focus here a little bit on NAMA and services trade. What ties the trilogy together, all three parts of it, is that the Doha Round has betrayed its original purpose. It is a failed counter-terrorist operation. It was designed when it was launched in the Qatari capital in November 2001 to liberalize trade and thereby help alleviate poverty and then in turn help reduce the conditions that render people vulnerable, Muslims vulnerable, to extremist messages. Nothing what I'm saying is politically correct, but that's the reality of it. And I say it as someone, of course, who teaches and has written a book recently on Islamic law. The idea of the Doha Round was to be that nonviolent counterpart to our military counter-terrorist operations. To give a little bit of um, more flesh on that argument that ties the trilogy together, you'll notice that it rests on a couple of questions. One is, is there really a link between or among trade liberalization poverty alleviation, and vulnerability to Islamist extremist messages? The answer is yes. It's not an adamantine causal connection, and the linkages are still being explored and researched. And it's certainly to be understood that not every Muslim is a terrorist, and that not every poor person is vulnerable to terrorism, and that no religion has a monopoly on vulnerability to terrorism or extremist messages. And it's also to be understood that the Doha Round had broader poverty alleviation goals. But the link is clear from a number of uh, pieces of evidence. One is careful academic research by economists like Paul Collier in The Bottom Billion, who talk about the conflict trap. Another example of evidence in support of links, uh, the links I'm talking about, is from our experience in the field the Special Operations Forces at the Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth, whom I have the honor of teaching, um, and I say teaching in quotes, uh, uh, Islamic law, report all the time that it's almost a de proposition when you ask, well, do you see among the poor or marginalized people that you deal with every day out in the field uh, a recruitment ground for Al-Qaeda or Boko Haram or other uh, Salafi jihadist groups? They say, yes, of course. Another question that this rests on, this argument of the treatise, is whether or not the Doha Round founders, the negotiators who drafted the ministerial declaration, knew of the link. And here the historical record is clear. They absolutely knew about it. It's, in, it's documented in and around uh, the Doha Round Declaration and the press releases and the various statements of the ministers. And it comes maybe best from our own, shortly after the round was launched, 9-11 Commission report, which says, economic openness is essential. Terrorism is not caused by poverty, yet when people lose hope, when societies break down, when countries fragment, the breeding grounds for terrorism are created. Economic growth expands the middle class, 
a constituency for further reform. And so we need, the report concludes, Muslim countries to become full participants in the rules-based global trading system as the United States considers lowering its trade barriers with the poorest Arab nations. Now, we look at that um, promise of Doha, and then we look at hundreds, actually I think it's probably now thousands of pages, single-spaced, lots of footnotes of Doha round negotiating texts uh, that I've um, had the good or misfortune of pouring over over the last 10 years. And the most recent and current negotiating texts come from December 2008 and April 2011. So you can imagine how I spent April and May um, looking at those texts. And they are mind-numbingly technical. Um, and, but when you step back and go through the technical details, you ask, do the proposed rules match up with the goal of poverty alleviation and uh, combating Islamist extremism, or VEOs, as special ops like to say, violent extremist organizations. When you look as a lawyer, trade lawyer, at the record, it's not good. Let me give a couple of examples. One is from NAMA, the Non-Agricultural Market Access, and it's what perhaps ought to be the simplest of all. It's reducing industrial tariff barriers, cutting tariffs on manufactured products. What is known as a non-linear formula or Swiss formula is used to cut the tariffs. And the key element in the formula is called the Swiss formula coefficient. Ideally, if the round were true to its original purpose, there would be at most perhaps two Swiss formula coefficients, one for the rest of the world, one for Muslim countries, and, or countries with large Islamic populations. You could start with the 57 members of the OIC. And the Swiss formula coefficient will then regulate the depth or the, extreme, the extremeness of cuts to bound MFN tariff rates. And it's an inverse relationship between the size of the coefficient and the depths of the cuts. And ideally, countries, Islamic developing countries with infant industries that need some protection, let's take uh, perhaps Egypt, perhaps Indonesia as examples, would be given a slightly higher Swiss formula coefficient. That's not what has happened. Instead, there have been a range of coefficients proposed for all kinds of categories of groups, small vulnerable economies, recently acceded members, Argentina, um, Brazil, Paraguay, and Uruguay, and Mercosur, SACU, but nothing special for countries vulnerable to Islamist extremism. As another example, services. Ideally, we would help developing Islamic countries in two respects on services. One is receive the services that they need and are not getting now and thus feeling marginalized. And that can be education services, water delivery services, sanitation services, by helping export our services to their countries, but on the other hand, not flooding their market with our service providers so it doesn't create in their minds a backlash that is a sense of their being neo-colonialized. That's not what happened, is what's happened either. Instead, the round has, uh, on services has achieved literally nothing. It has had no uh, services, uh, credible services text come out. And that's almost shameful because actually services negotiations predate um, the, the Doha round. The last point I'll conclude on is a little bit as Giuselino said about China. I was one of a number, and I'm just a footnote in it, but a number of commentators who had um, among the people who talked about the ballyhooed promise of uh, China entering the WTO, 
uh, back when it did in December of 2001, that it had the capacity to be a great statesman uh, and solve disputes uh, between U.S. and EU, and, and it could uh, have broad negotiating uh, agendas and, and, and put forth texts to solve big problems. It's not done that. You've not seen, to, for all the commercial and almost mercantilist self-interest that we've seen in U.S. and EU positions, China has not put forth a single comprehensive text to resolve the Doha round in its entire life in the WTO and throughout the entirety of the, of the Doha round. It has made marginal proposals on countervailing duties that suit its own self-interest, particularly as it's treated as a non-market economy by our own Commerce Department. Um, and the, set, the end of the second part of the trilogy asks the question whether China, given its internal security concerns, and you may know China now spends more on internal security per capita, it's about $71 U.S. per capita than it does on military defense, whether such an autocratic state can actually make the kinds of political compromises that would be necessary to bring the Do to resurrect the Doha round. Um, and whether such a state can actually put forth um, a comprehensive text. That is, again, not a politically correct thing to do. It can be a scary thing to challenge the mighty Chinese Communist Party. Um, but nothing I say in the trilogy is new or special in that respect of China. It's all from uh, reports we've all seen in the Financial Times and the BBC challenging China to live up to its promise of being a, a, a great statesman and maybe getting the round um, back to life. So with that, I'll stop, and I'm sorry for carrying over a bit. Morning. Uh, I'm just going to say uh, thanks, Scalino, you know, for putting this uh, nice panel together. And um, the topic I'm going to speak on is loosely the inevitability of distributive conflict in international economic law. Uh, it's not something that I think we can overcome. Is what I'm, the, the theme is, and I actually come out on a rather sanguine note. I actually think even if we don't overcome it, it's maybe not such a bad thing. So what I mean by distributive conflict and what its role is in international economic law. In theory, I think many of us who are interested in international trade or international finance will have no problem probably suggesting that one of the levers of what makes the system work is that export groups are seeking access to, China, to Chinese markets and so they want certain kinds of rules enforced. And the, on the other side may be some groups that are import competing groups, right, who are fighting against it, right, and that these two uh, play a very key role in driving the system. But despite our saying that, we don't always feel comfortable with that logic. And occasionally we interject what I would call purely, what I would call ideational beliefs into the system, not only because we think this is good, ideational that is, ideational I mean like something that improves global welfare, something that is good for everybody. Not only do we think because it's good to think about these things, that the WTO appellate body should be thinking about these things. By the way, I think they should be thinking about these things. But we also think it may explain a lot of what's going on. And here I take a little bit of a different approach. I suggest we don't have a lot of evidence that ideational forces do much explanation in international economic law. And we have to come to terms with that, even if we have great or significant normative beliefs. Maybe we should rest our laurels in saying, maybe it doesn't, and we have to think about how these players in distributive conflict can contribute to what our, our ideals are. And this is sort of what the theme of the paper is, that this is distributive conflict writ large. It does much of the explanation, um, probably, of what's going on. And this is all speculative, by the way, so I stand to be corrected on each point. Uh, if there is evidence in the other way. Uh, and so, and that we ought to 
try to think hard about how maybe we play along with these, in, these actors who, who care about these, what I would call distributive. And when I say distributive, international economic law, I'm not going to mince words, I mean cash, um, money. People are fighting basically over money. The, the value system in international economic law is there, but it doesn't resonate that strongly. Now, what does this mean from a practical perspective? It means that we should be cautious. Once we see institutions, by the way, domestically, internationally, statewide, however we see institutions, or policies that seem to stand across multiple electoral periods, they're relatively stable. We should Im assume immediately that because they're stable, that they're good for everyone or they're efficiency enhancing. This is sort of a very kind of, you know, rather trivial point, it, it might seem, but this is very important because I do think a lot of times when we see things stable that seem to last for a very long time, we assume they're efficiency enhancing. Slavery lasted for a very long time. Uh, in many ways, both economically and socially for a lot of people, it wasn't efficiency enhancing, right? So things can last that are not necessarily an interest of, uh, if you want to call it societal welfare writ large. So we should not always assume that if something is going on, it's good for everyone. That's the first thing. The second thing is that if an efficient arrangement lasts, we shouldn't assume that the reason why it lasts is because it's efficient. It may last because somebody's getting something out of it, right? And somebody, is that a very discreet, concrete, insular group that is benefiting and that's paying the premium to keep it going, right? And we have to separate these two things. Because if we assume that it's because of global welfare, it's because consumers are happy, it's because some child in China can now buy a pencil, you know, 20% less than what they used to buy it before, that that's what keeps international trade going and the markets liberalized. I am very suspicious that we'll be on the wrong foot. I think we have to think hard about what groups were seeking market access once, and that those groups, very importantly, uh, may be the, uh, the engines that drive both the process and uh, the regimes that we realize. And sometimes it may overlap with the normative ideals that we desire, and sometimes it may conflict. But I think it's something we have to accept. Now, as part of this, I'm just going to take a single example of a specific regime, at least in American trade history, that we often value as probably the most benign force or institutional move that drove free trade in the United States. The Reciprocal Trade Agreement Act of 1934, right? This is sort of the agreement that nailed the Smoot-Hawley tariffs down. That is the agreement that set in process what we think the regime of global trade liberalization. The United States passed a law that made it very, very easy for the president to ne negotiate reciprocal trade agreements. He didn't have to go back to Congress on each uh, bundle of items in which they uh, uh, negotiated these reciprocal trade agreements, and it was multilateral. So both the reciprocity and the multilateralism and the flexibility and the fact that he didn't have to go to the treaty clause all combine to what we think make free trade possible. The typical account of this usually has a very benign, right, what I would call the ideational view. It's, Roosevelt, Cordell Hall, these are all players thinking, how do we bring world peace? How do we stave off the Nazis? The, the, the kind of protectionism that is growing around the world. Think hard about processes and let's put it in place. And we think that this is sort of one of those areas where Congress kind of shed its protectionist impulses, shed its institutional pathologies and stood forth and did what was right. And we learned that because we saw the crisis, we saw the depression, and actors in crisis, like maybe we are today, will stand up and sometimes overlook their parochial differences and look for the common good. There's one little problem with this narrative. After the reciprocal trade agreement passed in 1934, every single time it came up for renewal until 1940, the onset of the war, almost every single Republican senator voted to repeal it. Only one in the entirety, only one Republican senator actually voted in favor of keeping it. So you have to ask the question, what is going on here? How could a crisis happen? How could a depression happen? How could Congress shed all of its pulses? How could we learn that free trade is a good thing? And yet, it seems that every Republican senator seemed to miss the boat. And why, by the way, did every Southern Democrat seem to understand what was going on? What is it about Southern Democrats that made them catch on to Ricardo before the entire 
Northern Republican establishment, by the way, the Republican Party in, 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 the, Northern, in, in the 1930s was distinctly not a presence in the South. It was a Northern, pretty much a Western party, and Midwestern party. So Ohio, by the way, Taft, was, was one of those pioneers who said, this, this reciprocal trade agreement, right, Taft, right, right to the 40s, was somebody who was opposed to it, right? So you gotta ask the question, why did this come about? And when you look at it, you look at the, something else that happened. Late in the 1940s, Republicans started to say, well, maybe not a bad idea. We shouldn't. We shouldn't vote against the Reciprocal Trade Agreement Act again. At this stage, they're gaining power in the Senate. They may have enough numbers to probably repeal it, but they start to change their mind. What happened? What happened during the war to make them change their mind? But there's also another thing that is interesting. At the time, at the time, the tariffs that led to the Smutali tariffs, the so tariffs that apparently wrecked the American economy took place, the conventional wisdom in the academy, there was no, and I quote, no academic economist who was willing to testify in the 1920s that raising tariffs was a good idea. So despite the almost uniform consensus that protectionism was a bad idea, how is it that the United States and our political system managed to raise tariffs that fast? And what I'm going to suggest is that ideas played a little role. Either in the decision, smooth hauling, people weren't thinking much about ideas, right, that led to the tariffs, and also the decision to repeal it. The reason why a lot of Republican senators broke the threshold in the 1940s ironically had to do with the war. The war changed the American economy. A lot of northern industries that used to be import competing, right, now had access, sometimes coercively, to European markets as part of the, you know, as part of the plan, right, uh, during the war and as part of the market that was created during the war, and their preferences changed. There was money to be made now by a lot of these Republican constituencies, manufacturing constituencies that supported Republicans, and so there was now a split in the Republican Party. But what you do have is that for an agreement that we think is at the core of one of the greatest changes in United States history, as to why we became a great trading power, why we persuaded others to become, is really when you look at the ingredients of it, a lot of what I would call interest, market access interests, play a key role in explaining its evolution. Not necessarily brilliant ideas. The ideas were already there. The consensus was already there. There was not that much of a different consensus on the value of free trade now than it was then. What this means is that we have to be particularly careful about what are the ingredients that make this work. And whenever we design institutions and we have in mind that we want to eliminate the role of special interests, we should always be aware that the reason why a lot of institutions and policies are in place is because there are some special interests that benefit. And maybe the institutional design question shouldn't be eliminate special interests, no. When there's a lot of money to be made and a lot of money to be lost, special interests will be a part of the picture, especially international economic law. The question will be is, how do you sometimes design institutions that make your goals complementary with those of the special interests? Who sometimes are going to provide both the capital, both the lobbying resources, right? Who goes out there? and pays those Congress people and gives them money and lobbies them day to night and stays to the late hours and says, please open up this market. It's not beautiful ideational players like law professors or trade economists. These are groups seeking market access. They provide what they call the grease, the political capital to make these things sustainable. Rather than kicking them to the curb, is to realize they have a key role to play, acknowledge that, find a way to accommodate them, and if we are resolute in trying to eliminate them, we may be undermining the kind of political will that makes these kinds of regimes endure. And if we better understand what their needs are, then we can all probably design institutions, not divorced from material interests, but that complement material interests, and that make much more sense. I'll leave it at that until question and answer. Right.
it's a pleasure to uh, and an honor to be a part of this panel with uh, Juscelino and Raj and Jude, and to talk with you about the crisis in international law. So I, I thank you. I, I have uh, these slides. Um, so I took seriously the invitation to think about the crisis in international law. And uh, unlike Ruth Wedgwood, who we heard earlier uh, in, in a brilliant speech, I think that there is a crisis in international law and that the uh, crises that we see in particular areas, uh, environment, security, finance, uh, could be better addressed uh, using a different idea of international law. So this is a, an area in which I, I hesitate to, but disagree with Jide. I, I think ideas do matter, uh, and they matter in the sense of institutional imagination about uh, our understanding of the options that are available to us to deal with real issues. Of course, uh, as Jide points out, welfare matters and politics matter, but Ideas about our interests and how to address our interests are, are what I'm interested in in this paper. Uh, so, uh, like uh, Raj, I, I immediately went to the dictionary, but I didn't go to a very sophisticated dictionary. I went to dictionary.com. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, we all choose the definitions that serve our purposes best. Uh, and I liked this one that a crisis is a stage in a sequence of events at which the trend of all future events, especially for better or for worse, is determined. Now, as Mark Twain said about his death, uh, the death of the Westphalian system has been prematurely stated many times, and I hesitate to uh, add to those premature declarations. But I think after over a century of uh, concern about the Westphalian system and the multiplication of exceptions, of problems, of circumstances in which we seem to override, and, and really each bit of international law that is made seems to do so, and this was really discussed and predicted in 1964 in Wolfgang Friedman's uh, manager, ma magisterial work, The Changing Structure of International Law, uh, we see that there's a law of cooperation, and it involves a number of very practical problems in finance, environment, security, and so on. And we are seeing uh, an increasing number of these problems, and the model of the strong state, of the state that uh, has a domain reserve that can't be impinged upon, uh, seems to be troublesome. And so our choice, this crisis today, is a choice about keeping, it's an idea choice, about keeping the idea of the strong state or having a broader set of options uh, of institutional choices. So uh, just some, some symptoms of this uh, paradigm's breakdown. Uh, it has this concept of the strong state, the uh, rugged individualist state, with the requirement of consent at, at every stage. In fact, uh, some international legal scholars are proposing more requirements of consent, even in customary international law. There's a recent paper by uh, Bradley and uh, Gulati suggesting that in customary international law, there should be a requirement of subsequent consent. There's a growing literature about soft law, making lemonade out of lemons. Uh, since international law is never binding, uh, we should have soft law that doesn't even purport to be binding. Of course, soft law can play an important role, and there are advantages to it in some circumstances. But my argument is that hard law is important, too, and has its own domain and that soft law is inadequate to address some of the most pressing problems. In fact, some of the problems that we see are problems that could be addressed if only we had stronger international law. Uh, and, and what I mean by stronger international law is not an idealistic perspective about uh, a United Nations with its own army or, or something of that nature. Uh, 
uh, but a stronger international law that could be reliable for states, where states could have the freedom to contract reliably the way commercial people do in domestic society. And I believe we don't have that at this moment. So uh, I think there is this, uh, this growing paradigm shift. As I say, I hesitate to take a snapshot of it and say it's changed today, but I, I think we can look at the facts and imagine that there's an increasing number of challenges. Uh, as I said, Friedman uh, spoke about this in terms of the move from an international law of coexistence, focusing on diplomacy and maybe security, to an international law of cooperation, focusing on things that in modern economics we would call externalities and public goods problems. Uh, and this, uh, this formalist Westphalian paradigm seems to be giving way in practical ways. It seems to have already given way in areas like trade uh, and, uh, and environment and human rights to a, a more substantive functionalist paradigm that says, let's see where there are things we can actually do, uh, things where we can't succeed in addressing global warming without cooperating, and we need institutions with which to cooperate. How can we design those institutions to make our lives better, to achieve both our welfare interests uh, and our political interests. And, and we can put this in terms of scientific revolutions. What, what uh, Thomas Kuhn said is that as the exceptions to a paradigm multiply, there's a search for another paradigm. And, and the one that I propose based on work between the, the two world wars by uh, David Matrani and, uh, and others who came after him is a, a kind of functionalism, a kind of specific, on the ground, factually oriented functionalism that says, what is our specific cooperation problem? What is it that troubles us as states between us? What kinds of rules or institutions might be useful for us to address those? So it's, it's different from Mitrani's and Haas's and other functionalisms in that it's, it purports to be based on some modern social scientific ideas about cooperation problems and their resolution. So uh, maybe the exceptions that I would point to are, are obvious to all of us. We have uh, more and more, especially in the area that I focus on, trade law, more and more behind the border law, more and more senses in which there are policy externalities, the things done in one state, the subsidies, the regulation, all sorts of things, the education, uh, has an effect on the welfare of people in other states. Obviously, we can't address all of those things, uh, but the move in trade law has definitely been to ex address more and more of those kinds of things. So you might say, as those things multiply, uh, that idea of the unconstrained state is, is, is simply no longer factually accurate. You have a kind of Swiss cheese sovereignty, or as uh, Abe and Tony Chase called it, uh, the new sovereignty, a sovereignty where states are able to and do contract with one another. Uh, and I also believe that as we look at some of our most pressing crises in the real world today, uh, global warming, uh, cybersecurity, monetary imbalances, that there is a need for actually stronger international law to address those things. And in the sense that I mentioned earlier of longer term contracting. So in an area like uh, global warming, uh, we have probably a, a solution to that problem would include wealthy states engaging in greater sacrifices early while poor states agree to engage in sacrifices later. That kind of a deal would require you to trust those currently poor states to, com to comply with their obligations later. You would need a kind of strong international law to give that reliability and to facilitate that kind of transaction. Similarly with monetary policy where uh, poor states should be allowed to develop surpluses while they're poor with the idea that later on they would reduce those surpluses. One of the problems we see is China's persistent surplus. And as we look at our needs, I think it's also important uh, to look at the future. 
Uh, and uh, there are some, many dimensions to the future, but some that I looked at in the book that uh, was the, the, the that, that this paper introduces are changing globalization, changing development, technology, demography, demography, and democracy. As we look at those changes, we can see even more needs for international cooperation. And indeed, in some ways, uh, some of these changes will make international cooperation easier as well. So the proposal is a replaced paradigm from the Westphalian paradigm to a kind of social science functionalism uh, where uh, social science uh, looks at uh, externalities and public goods problems and says, uh, there's this thing that we could address if only we were playing a, a cooperative game uh, in game theory terms, one in which we can agree, as opposed to a, a non-cooperative game. Um, and shouldn't we have the capability to do that? Wouldn't that be useful to have the capability to do that? And so the idea would be to identify specific cooperation problems uh, and then to identify specific legal and institutional responses that would focus on welfare both in, a, in an economic sense and in a political sense, obviously, as, as Jide argued. Things don't happen unless there's national political approval. Uh, but national political approval uh, comes from politics, and politics also comes to some extent, at least, from welfare. And so we can see uh, the transnational political linkage between different states in reciprocal transactions through international law. In fact, you can see the growing aspect in which international law is the mechanism for linking political coalitions in different states so that they can uh, make trade-offs and, and bargains that increase all of their positions. And so uh, with some of these uh, existing problems and some of these future problems, I think we will see a, a, an increasing demand for international law. And then with an increasing demand for international law, we have a question, how do we supply that international law? What general institutional changes, what constitutional changes in the international legal system would be required to facilitate those things. And, and uh, one of the problems uh, which I, I can remark on in questions is the problem of fragmentation, the problem of the way that we make international law in separate functional silos uh, without adequately having those different areas interact with one another. Uh, the need to strengthen the enforcement of international law, the need to enable the making of international law to bind holdouts. This is the problem with all sorts of international public goods problems. How do you bind holdouts to get them to contribute to the public good? That's why we have domestic government, and it's why we need something in international law. So to conclude, uh, we see uh, increasing interaction, globalization, demand for international law, increasing exceptions. That's the law of cooperation that Friedman pointed to increasing exceptions to this Westphalian paradigm, uh, a possible move to something that can be explained better than the Westphalian paradigm using this social science functionalism. And once we have that idea, we can open up our minds to a, a greater ability to make international law and institutions. Thank you. Uh, before opening to questions, and we want to uh, maximize that as much as possible, I just have one question for each of the uh, uh, panelists, and then uh, I would, it would help if you, each of you kind of limited your responses to about two, three minutes, and then we can move to questions from the audience. Okay? Thank you. Uh, to Professor Raj I, uh, uh, Bala, I have a question. You mentioned in your uh, uh, article uh, that a major negotiation asymmetry in the NAMA and the service talks uh, is that developing countries having um, made huge, uh, uh, developed countries rather, having made huge concessions in tariffs over the last 40 years, have very little to offer in the form of further uh, tariff concessions and uh, to LDCs, uh, less developed countries. And LDCs now seem to uh, want to hang on what they've got, the you know, lower level of terrification, the lower levels of terrification that they are, that they are exposed to when uh, dealing with uh, industrial uh, goods in, 
uh, exporting them to developed countries. These uh, less developed countries seem to be to want to hang on to them, uh, offering therefore very little in have very little to offer in return. From their perspective, they've I mean they've really now that they're in deep into industrialization, they really stand uh, uh, to gain very little by making concessions uh, in in general, at least in, in tariffs. Hence the pressure from developed countries to, you know, try to get them to make uh, uh, not necessarily, uh, uh, you know, uh, ter uh, not only tariffs, uh, 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 tariff reductions, but non-tariff, uh, uh, reducing non-tariff barriers. So how does, do you, how do you think the stalemate can be uh, broken, uh, especially if you contemplate the idea of a potential parallel round that has happened since 1984, which uh, I, I decided to call it recently, the Geneva round, that has taken place in the uh, WTO panels and appellate bodies who have really made decisions that uh, constantly seem to ratchet down uh, the role of, regula of regulations, whether it is in the environmental area or other areas that might have a restrictive uh, trade effect. Well, thank you for the question. You uh, correctly uh, and s accurately summarized the stalemate in NAMA, particularly on sectoral negotiations. The United States, the EU, Japan, Canada um, perceive that because there's so many exceptions now to the Swiss formula, uh, that they will not get any significant market access in the big emerging countries, particularly Brazil, China, and India. So the major trading powers are demanding that those emerging countries participate in sectoral negotiations, which would create duty-free um, access in particular sectors like electronics, toys, chemicals, which is an important one for the U.S. Um, whereas the developing countries come back and say, we refuse to guarantee participation in a sectoral. Um, and that, that's exactly the, the, the stalemate. Um, the developed countries say, we have nothing left to offer because our tariffs are already quite low. And in fact, if you apply the Swiss formula coefficient, which is now set for developed countries at eight, the U.S. would have to cut its bound industrial MFN tariffs to such low levels that the follow-on cuts in our applied tariff rates would leave us with an average of a 0 0.7 uh, applied tariff rate. Um, so how to get out of it? Um, well, uh, a couple of possibilities. One is one of the most violated principles in GATT is Article 28 BIS. 28 BIS says that the agreement to bring your tariffs to zero or to bind low tariff rates, rates that are already low, at those low rates or at zero is equivalent in value as a trade concession to a dramatic drop in tariffs, say from 50% of an Indian tariff down to 10%. So the Indians cannot come back to say to the Americans, well, you're only going down from 1.7 to 0 0.7, and we're going from 50 to 20. 28 bis blocks that argument because it anticipates that there is this kind of asymmetry uh, or tariff dispersion, as we say. So one is to respect um, the GATT. Uh, and, and, and give the American argument the, the credit it's due legally. Um, second um, way out of it is, as you said, they're now developing some alternatives, and this is part of the broader theme of international on crisis. Um, UNCTAD has come out uh, basically with a reasonably successful south-south um, uh, um, plurilateral trade agreement, and we may see negotiations shifting more and more um, to a forum like that. We already all know that they're shifting much more, aside from uh, the problems in their own Congress with FTAs, they're shifting to FTAs. A third answer, which is, you know, what the, which is the um, uh, ideational, uh, maybe idea uh, behind the trilogy, is to refocus the round on what it was initially designed to do. Thank you. Uh, my question for uh, uh, Professor Gidi Nzlibi would be, uh, 
I would start by saying that uh, uh, John Maynard Keynes, Professor Trotman, and I, so I mean, very good company, mm -hmm. we all seem to agree that in the end, uh, ideas, not only vested interests, uh, not only vested interests really matter. And uh, uh, so my question to you is, goes back to the beginning of, uh, the beginnings of uh, trade scholarship. Uh, uh, we all know Ricardo's theory of comparative advantage. Won the battle of ideas, uh, often forgotten is the, uh, the notion that the greatest loser from the repeal of the Corn Laws uh, in England uh, were, uh, was the rentier uh, class, the aristocrats, who due to the, an importation of, or uh, limits on the importation of grain into England, uh, stood to gain higher and higher rents on land, uh, they are the landed aristocracy after all, as more and more marginal land came, to com came into production in, uh, in England. They were, uh, uh, as more land came into production, they, they could charge higher rents and uh, 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 to the detriment of you know, the labor, the, the workers uh, who basically uh, had to pay uh, higher prices for foodstuffs. And since, as we, as we all know, that their marginal propensity to consume is infinitely higher than that of the Rontier class, we had, you know, the people like T.R. Malthus worried about depression and as a precursor to uh, Keynes. The idea is the, the notion of comparative advantage won out. The idea of the, the greater gains from trade through specialization by all nations uh, spread. But in the background of that idea, you had the notion that they were there were distributive effects of comparative advantage. At least at that time, the losers were those who could stand to lose the most. The landed aristocracy, not the workers. That idea has, uh, has progressed. Are the present uh, 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 distributive conflicts, the results of blind allegiance perhaps to an idea uh, uh, that at its birth had a distributional concern, but over time was retained only for its efficient efficiency uh, purpose. And if that's the case, is it, uh, 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 is it, is this a time to start rethinking about uh, uh, comparative advantage, not only in efficiency terms, but also in the distributive implications that it had originally? Right. I, I have one response, actually, that I think may be hit home, and it's um, Paul Krugman, not in his modern manifestation as, <laughs> as an opinion maker and a, uh, I guess a editorial uh, analyst, but a, as a trade economist, uh, would think seriously about some of these issues. And what he wanted to do at one time was write about the, mech and the me and mechanisms of trade negotiations and modern trade negotiations. He goes in and observes, he talks to a bunch of trade people. And he comes in and, <laughs> and this is a this is the article. It's a Journal of Economic Literature article, and it's called, What Should Trade Negotiators Negotiate About? Mm -hmm. And this is his takeaway. The economist who wants to influence the international trade policy, like I do, as opposed to merely jeer at its foolishness, must not forget a fundamental thing, that the economic theory underlying all trade negotiations is pure nonsense. From an economic perspective, it makes no sense whatsoever to an economist. Accept that, he says. Be willing to think as the negotiators think, and you can make some argument of that sense of the world. But if you ever not, he even said things like strategic tariff policy. He says it has no role. Like even when, even when it turns out that you want to use tariffs to gain leverage, he says negotiators don't even know what I'm talking about. They have a whole different world of world, which is a really, really mercantilist, crude mercantilist world, which he says I don't quite understand from an economic perspective, but that's how it goes on. And I say that in, in part because when you bring up the Corn Laws, one of the biggest debates in economic history is what drove the Corn Laws. Was it really vested interests and how much did ideas play? And they have these intricate models trying to separate the world of ideas. But I have to say this, look at the Corn League and look at how much money they pumped into Parliament. I have to say, these are not the that's not the kind of money that philosophers, armchair, free trade economists pump into a process when they're concerned about the ideals. The interests definitely played a role. By the way, I don't think the interests that played the role, the most significant interests that played a role, I don't think is the corn 
uh, sector or those who were importing corn, it was cotton. It was the cotton uh, industry, and, and we can get into debates about that. As an aside, I want to say in, in the American context, there's more of a regional flavor to the impetus that drives much of this. By the way, when I say regional flavor, I had this discussion with uh, Trackman earlier. Regional flavor not only now, but right from the inception, which is the South was the organ, the interest that really, really pushed free trade the most, right? The origins of it may have a lot to do with the fact of how they modified labor costs in the cotton world, right? And that's a long dispute that we won't get into that caused civil war and whatnot, but it was, farming has always been an area where we had, America had an advantage and in things that the South that they did. But if you remove that from the picture, actually, the, the impetus that drives trade, even post-1930s, is very fragile in the United States. If you just do the counting, it is very fragile. So all I'm just trying to say is that you can't, I, I'm not, it's hard to isolate it. What I'm trying to say is let's push back on an emphasis that we sometimes don't put in the core of the picture. That in the background, these players who gain a lot have a lot of say, and the ultimate design of these institutions, and whether they succeed like in the Doha round or not, often plays out when they're willing to invest the capital. And when they feel Doha round is not getting me what I want to get, mm -hmm. I'm pulling out, it kind of feel, you know, filters mm -hmm. away. And that, that's just all I was trying to get to, is just to think more about that link when you think about institutional design. Excellent. Professor uh, Trockman, uh, my hope briefer question for you is, how does the functionalist approach you propose a deal or would deal, uh, how would the approach you propose would deal with the most formidable long-term threat to the operation of the nation state, uh, to the current operation of the, uh, of the current nation state, the power and influence of the modern day multinational corporation? How does jettisoning uh, uh, the nation state uh, help deal with problems like climate change, monetary coordination, if you have, you, you also need to consider that uh, uh, you have a new center of formidable power in the multinational corporation and how do you think that uh, a fu uh, functionalist approach that you propose would handle that new center of power? Thank you for that interesting question. Um, first, uh, just to, uh, I, mean, I should clarify what I said. I, I don't propose jettisoning the nation state. Um, it, it's uh, really uh, having nation states enter into more international law that uh, would uh, enhance and reduce their power in uh, subtle ways. And I think uh, multinational corporations, of course, are corporations, um, still today, all corporations, and maybe there's a European, modest European exception, all corporations are creatures of national law. They're, they're formed under national law. And they're regulated uh, territorially and based on effects and other things by, by states. And, and so I take your question to be that, uh, A, they have power, but B, they, they're, they're kind of spread out. Their interests are no longer aligned. And Perhaps. so the way uh, this social science functionalism approach would look at them is to say, yes, the, the, they cause externalities. And in fact, among states, uh, there's a, a, a possible public good in being able to regulate certain aspects of those multinational corporations. Uh, taxation, you didn't mention taxation, but that's the one that comes right. First, to my mind, how do we as states uh, deal with the fact that, and, and this is coming up in American politics today, how do we deal with the fact that uh, multinational corporations can design their affairs uh, across states in a way that minimize their taxation? We can say the same thing in, uh, in financial regulation. Professor Bala has written eloquently about uh, transnational financial regulation. And so th this comes up, and we can say that the financial crisis, uh, to some extent, uh, exhibited or, or, or showed us um, in strong ways the uh, inability 
to regulate uh, on a state-by-state -state basis some things. There's regulatory competition. If we regulate uh, bank capital in one state, uh, why doesn't that bank move into another state? And, and so there, there are definitely uh, reasons for cooperation. So that social science functionalism perspective would say, yes, there are externalities, public goods problems, uh, regulatory competition. And under those circumstances, uh, there would be circumstances in which it would be useful to regulate uh, multinational corporations in a coordinated way. So I, I think it's consistent with the idea. In fact, as, as perhaps you're suggesting, it's probably a leading edge mm -hmm. of this idea that uh, as we have greater globalization, multinationalization of, of business, uh, we see greater cooperation problems. Uh, and so since the corporations are the vanguard of uh, these externalities, uh, we would expect to see uh, international cooperation in, in, in those kinds of areas, maybe before we see it in other areas. Thank you. The remaining time should be left to uh, the audience. Please, uh, when you introduce yourself, uh, when you, before you ask your question, introduce yourself and try to limit your question uh, to uh, the maximum amount uh, of words possible. The minimum amount of words possible, sorry. Uh, Deepa Badina right now from Captain Law School. I have a question for each of the panelists, and I'll go in the order of your presentation. Uh, please limit your questions to one, one question, yes, because otherwise we won't get as much participation. Would you be so kind as to Oh, thank you. All right, which one shall I choose? <laughs> All right, I'll just ask Raj Bala the question, because uh, uh, that's the first presentation. So my question would be with respect to um, your interesting connections between um, poverty, trade, um, and Islam. And the question I have for you is what do you, what, what do you think of the role of Saudi Arabia? Because it's a country that's not necessarily poor. And if you can think of bin Laden, he came from Saudi Arabia and started this movement. And so my question is, uh, would that change your analysis or influence your analysis in terms of the role of poverty? And the sub-question is, in terms of uh, trade itself, um, some of the Islamic nations are quite rich in uh, mineral resources, including oil, that doesn't uh, fall within the scope of international trade law. And to what extent would that affect how we look at poverty questions and the influence of trade um, on, on affecting the way Islamic movements uh, occur in these places? Thank you. Yeah, the Saudi case and bin Laden in particular is typically cited for the proposition that, of course, not all uh, terrorists are from poor backgrounds. Uh, and the paper, of course, readily concedes that. And uh, there are other examples uh, of individual figures. Awahiri, for example, is one of them. Um, the, um, uh, what's, what's often missed, uh, and it's a logical leap um, that's made, what's missed is that there are large segments of Saudi society that are desperately poor. And the jihadi movements in the kingdom are, are getting their, recruit, uh, their recruits from those desperately poor segments. In other words, the, the, the great stratification um, in not only the kingdom but in other GCC countries is a real problem. Um, bottom line being that, that while it's not, again, an adamantine link that if you're poor, you're going to feel marginalized, and if you're marginalized, you're going to be susceptible to a, uh, a violent strain of uh, religious ideology. Um, but it's a breeding ground for, to which the likes of Zawahiri go um, in, in their own countries and in places like Yemen, uh, Somalia, uh, Afghanistan, which are uh, basically almost entirely poor. No. <laughs> uh, you know, just to give a couple of sentences, um, I think that the dispute settlement um, system, including the appellate body, has been rather nuanced and rather politically savvy 
uh, in responding to the world. Uh, and, and, and I think you know, th there has been the power of ideas in terms of free trade, but I think that they've restrained themselves to uh, follow the text and, and they've been fairly careful in following the text. And I don't think there are significant challenges to, you know, in, in the Doha round, there hasn't been a significant challenge mounted to the dispute settlement process. No one has said we, you know, there, there, there are some Washington lobbyists who, who have said, you know, our, our trade remedies have been attacked too much, but I don't think that's had much salience. So I, I don't think it's in crisis. I agree with everything with, with what Joel said. And also, I know Gia has written about this. i just add two. Um, uh, clouds on the horizon. Um, one is the quality of individual appellate body members that are being proposed. I was disappointed to learn that India and Pakistan have nominated people to the appellate body uh, that are not lawyers um, or have no significant legal experience. So uh, in the U.S., um, in its um, nominees, uh, may, and I'm, I'm putting this as a speculative, you know, que in a question form, I don't know, uh, may be increasingly concerned about the um, trade orientation of their candidates and how they're going to react. And it may, if it turns more like a Supreme Court type of nominating process rather than sort of on the intellectual merits, that may be a concern country by country. The second thing is um, the quality of the writing of the appellate body reports. Um, I, 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 I don't want to speak for my co-panelists, but I think we all have challenges using those appellate body reports for their pedagogical value with students, um, trying to edit them down. Um, and I, 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 I sh I'm a hypocrite in terms of length, but some of these are really getting out of control and um, not, not the crisp judicial-like opinions we'd hope for. And we have time, I think, for one more question. Uh, from the perspective of, of uh, candidate uh, uh, for president, uh, uh, his, his comment that corporations are people too. From an international law point of view, is there any support for that that any of you may know of? That, that corporations are people? Yes. I think uh, you uh, should answer that. <laughs> There's a gentleman here who, who probably has some deeply held views about this issue, but I, I, I am completely open-ended and uninformed about the status of corporations as individuals, but I don't know if you have any. There's, there's no uh, international law doctrine that says that corporations are equivalent to natural persons. Uh, corporations do have some protections under international law, uh, but, but I think that idea, I, I, you know, to, to, I don't know if I want to defend <laughs> Romney or, or attack him, but I, I think what he meant was that behind corporations there are workers and shareholders who are just like you and me, um, and, and we do need to focus on that as well. We have no more time. Uh, uh, regrettably, we have no more time, and I would like to thank you, the panel, thank the panelists for being here and the audience for the great questions. Thank you.